So hello everyone, I'm Sarah and I'm one of the co-organizers of the Top 20 Secure PLC Coding Practices project. And uh, Vivek Ponada, uh, my co-organizer and I will give you an introduction to our project today, to why it's important and to why we did it and how we did it. Well, the Secure Coding Practices project, project is about writing secure coding practices for PLCs, so for programmable logic, logic controllers. And it actually was sparked or inspired by Jake Brodsky, who gave a presentation at S4 in 2020 in Miami. And that presentation was on secure PLC programming, obviously, and on a few hints and tips and tricks how someone who's been working in the field for a lot of years uh, programs a PLC to be more reliable or more um, and, and, and more secure in the end. The video is available on YouTube and it's become uh, a classic by now. And after this talk, um, a couple of people came together and said, well, we need to make something out of it. Because one of Jake's main statements was secure PLC programming, really no one knows this at school. And what he meant was that the engineers who program PLCs do not learn anything about security at school first, but then also they don't learn anything about how to securely program a PLC at school. And the simple reason for this is and was that there is nothing to teach because unlike for normal IT software, where we have a lot of secure practice, secure coding principles, secure coding practices, um, published by Microsoft, published by universities that are normal to learn for programmers. For PLC, there is nothing you could teach. There are no secure PLC program practice, programming practices. And after that talk, a couple of people said, okay, let's change that. Different by Dave Peterson, who's organizing S4. We said, okay, let's create something from a community, from engineers for engineers, um, and let's try to define how to securely program a PLC. And the reason why it was important was pretty obvious because we all knew for at least a decade, maybe even longer, that PLCs are vulnerable. There was a, a project that was for called Project Basecamp uh, about a decade ago showing PLC vulnerabilities and a lot of things have followed for virtually all PLC vendors. There are PLCs are, are insecure by design, and that's not always used to be a bad thing because some, par some parts of these PLC vulnerabilities are actually PLC features. They just haven't been uh, built and programmed with security in mind. So it's no, no surprise that they're vulnerable. And all these um, advisories and all these news that there are new vulnerabilities found in PLCs keep coming, leaving engineers more or less um, in despair, or at least uh, with nowhere to start, because um, all these vulnerabilities keep coming, but we don't really develop things a, a so what. So we develop uh, ideas how to fix certain vulnerability. We don't really develop something to make PLCs more secure in general. So there are so many problems. We all know PLCs are somehow the Achilles heel of a plant, one of the most vulnerable part of a plant, and we don't really have anything in our hands that we can hand over to engineers and say, well, if you do it like this, it even gets it, it gets better. At least it doesn't get worse. And you don't build in all these vulnerabilities. So then there's one big argument um, or one big understanding in the industry saying, well, PRCs and security, that just doesn't fit. You know, PLCs, they, they are just not made for security. They're insecure by design. And so many of these standard, well-known secure coding practices that we know for other software, that's not even applicable to PLCs. We don't know how to do that for PLCs. And there's very much truth in it because it doesn't really doesn't make sense to simply take the secure programming practices you see from IT and Try to try to implement them on on a PLC the same way that that won't work. Uh, it's the same way if you able to ask a ask a fish to climb a tree the same way that a monkey does. It's just not made for it. It doesn't make much sense for it to climb a tree at all. 
But that doesn't really mean that PLCs are not made for security after all. They just need to, um, we just need to rethink uh, how to achieve security for PLCs using its characteristics. Because a PLC, um, you would even say, or some people would say, many IT people would say, well, a PLC is just too dumb for security. And I can understand where that comes from because in a way a PLC is dumb. Um, in a way you could describe everything that a PLC does with, well, you have one job. Or, or to be a bit more fair, you had four jobs, but that's it. So a PLC has a recurring scan cycle that it does over and over again. So it reads inputs from a sensor. So in this example here, we've got a fluid level sensor. So it reads where the fluid is, maybe water or oil or anything. And it reads that input from an input through an input interface, processes it in its in its CPU and stores it in memory, and then it loads the program from memory and executes the logic. It loads, and the logic looks way different than it would look in a normal um, computer program. And then it maybe communicates with some kind of external component like an HMI or a programming laptop, and then it writes output. So if the level uh, the fluid level here is too low, it might say, well, start the pump and pump some fluid in there. And all these four steps, it repeats endlessly, that's the scan cycle, uh, and it does it always the same way, and always in the same time, and that's it. So a PSC has certain characteristics. Um, it's a process expert. It really communicates directly to the process, directly with the process. It knows what the process is about. It doesn't have to do a lot of fancy anomaly analysis because uh, its own job, its its very job, and its only job is to know about the process and to keep track of certain process values and keep them keep them on track. Um, and yes, it's true. A PLC mostly has limited resources because it has a very designated task and that doesn't change much and you don't need all the resources in the world for it. But instead, it's very important that it's reliable so that you know if you if you give it a value and uh, after a certain time there is an output and you you can it can absolutely guarantee that that output comes within a certain time and that that's what we call uh, real it's real time capable so the pump absolutely relies on the PLC giving it the output it needs to be deterministic so when you put something in, an input in, it always returns the same output. And all IT people know that that's totally not normal in for normal devices and for Ethernet networks. So a PSC really is not dumb. It's just different. It has one job or four jobs and is really, really well at doing these jobs. And this is the setup that we need to live with and that we need to accept and that we need to look for strength um, that we can use for security benefits. So what we wondered at the beginning of our project was, what does it mean after all to securely program a PLC? We all know security is important and we all know that PLCs are vulnerable and we want to make them more secure. But what does a securely program, program PLC mean? And what is a secure PLC? So these were the two leading questions. Um, that we try to answer um, with the top 20 secure coding practices list, or at least um, we try to give a first basis for discussion for these questions. Um, I give you a short introduction of how this list looks and what, how it's structured and what our assumptions were. And then Vivek will give you a deep dive into a couple of practices to give you a better feeling. So the top 20 list, if you download it, you can go to the project website. We show that at the end. Um, you can download it for free. It has the most permissive license, so you can virtually do anything with it. We want it to spread. We want it to spread to engineers. Um, anyway, if you download it, you first look at two pages, um, and these two pages contain all the 20, 20 practices that we propose. And they all have a title, they all have a short description, and they have a number, and that's it. And the number that's important to note is not a ranking. So um, a practice with number one is not more important or, um, or anything than a practice with number 20. And then if you keep on reading, 
there's about 40 more pages with details on all the secure coding practices. So here is a, an example um, on what the details look like. And the example practice we're taking here is validate inputs based on physical plausibility, which is one of my favorite practices to explain because it really is a practice that uses the uh, characteristics, the superpowers that naturally come to a PSC, that a PSC is really good at, like fishes at swimming. And that's, of course, because the PSC, as we said, is a process expert. It's really good at knowing what values, what process values are normal and are good and are acceptable. Um, so if you, for example, have a gate and the gate takes a certain time to open physically, it always takes five seconds until it's open because it physically can't be done more quickly. And the PSC gets a value from a sensor which says, well, gate is closed, but it's only half a second. Um, since since it asked or since the gate started to close, then the PRC knows something is wrong, or at least can know something is wrong. You can ask the PRC about that. So that is something uh, that you can use to validate uh, PRC inputs. And that's something very unusual because it's not something how we could validate an input for a normal software because normal software usually doesn't have physical um, inputs or physical outputs, but the PRC does. So there are things where you really don't need a fancy security monitoring tool, uh, and you don't need um, a KI by AI-based anomaly detection or anything, but you just need a PSC um, whose job it is to know the process. And for this practice, we've got the title, we've got the short description that basically summarizes what I just said. And then for each practice, we have a security objective. And that summarizes in a quickly in a quick way and as a tag, if you so will, um, what the main security objective is that a practice fulfills. And that could be either integrity, and a lot of times it's integrity for PSC of PSC logic, of I/O values, or of PSC variables. In this case, it's integrity of I/O values. Um, but it could also be something like hardening or resilience or monitoring. We'll look at that in a minute. And then. Uh, we also define a target group because not all practices can be implemented by the same target group. We use the ISA 62443 target groups. You may know them. It's product suppliers, it's integration and maintenance service providers, and it's asset owners. And truth is that a lot of practices, always depending on who programs the PSCs, of course, but a lot of practices cannot really be integrated, be, be implemented by asset owners because a lot of, um, especially low level programming happens at the product suppliers and the integration and maintenance pro service provider side. And then we've got a section called guidance where really everything goes into that helps implementing the practices, be it screenshots, um, be it cooking recipes for, for different makes or models of PSCs, be it background information that you need to know in order to implement the practice, whatever uh, goes into the guidance. And then we've got a section called examples, which can be implementation scenarios, or it can be scenario examples for certain industries or products, um, or it can also be examples of what could happen if, it, if a practice is not implemented, which is important to understand the security benefit. Talking of security benefit, that's another very important section we have in our for each of our PSC programming practices. Um, and these sections involve the why section. So why is, is this programming practice important? And of course, it's secure PSC programming practices. So it's um, actually uh, all of these practices are beneficial for security, obviously. But then also, Many of these practices, and that's a very important point to make um, so that that sink in, a lot of these practices also have benefits for reliability and they also have, have benefits for maintenance, for example. If you take this example here, so um, validating inputs based on physical plausibility, of course that's good because you can validate um, if an attacker has uh, manipulated value, tempered with a sensor or anything. So that's 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 good. You can give an alert, but you can also use the validation for reliability purposes. So if something doesn't work, if some something may be broken mechanically, 
um, the same the same um, feature can can give you a hint that something like this is wrong. So that is things where um, that statement that we often read that there's always a trade-off between security and comfort, between security and operability, uh, between security and usability, between security and operations, that there's always a trade-off that's actually not always true, at least for the secure PRC coding practices, that's actually not the case. For every single practice that we have here, we've got not only a security benefit, but also a benefit that falls in the realm of operations. And that's a very important point to make um, because that's often the case in, in OT because um, security uh, with having processes and having PSC characteristics in mind is often about reducing complexity. It's often about better monitoring. It's often about um, better structuring of code. It's often about better documentation. And all of these things are actually things that mostly do not stand in the way uh, of usability like long passwords would do, um, but they really help operations. Last, we also have references. Uh, we have references to existing standards and frameworks, and that could be for two causes. So first, we, we reference attacks or weaknesses or vulnerabilities that a certain practice could prevent. That would be MITRE attack or MITRE CWE in these cases here. And we could we, do, we also reference security requirements that the practice uh, under consideration could help to fulfill. Uh, and these are, in these cases here, ISA 62443 requirements. And that could be extended, of course. Small look at the security objective. Um, what can we expect from a security program, PSC, and what can't we expect? Looking at the objectives, um, we see a pretty clear um, structure here. So we see that most of our 20 uh, secure programming practices uh, have integrity benefits. And that is actually not a surprise because what a PRC does is um, making sure that values, process values, IO values um, stay on track. And the most important thing that you could imagine, the most important threat scenario you could imagine doing to a PRC, of course, is tampering with its integrity. And then um, the other part would be uh, monitoring, because as we said before, a big issue with PRCs and a big benefit of PRCs is um, that they are process experts. They know about the process so much better than all your fancy security tools can learn <laughs> in a long time. So for some cases, for some monitoring purposes, PRCs can actually do a kind of work. And also they can help with resilience and hardening if you have a few practices for these. One very important point to make is uh, securely programming a PRC is most likely not the first step you would take in a security program. It's not the most important. And of course, no, these practices would not have prevented Stuxnet, at least not alone. Um, but it's simply, and that's the, the whole goal of all this, turning a PRC, which, or, which has always been one of the most vulnerable components in a plant, the, the Achilles heel in a plant, turn these vulnerable components at least to one more layer of security, to a last line of defense that stands like a bodyguard in front of your most important processes in the plant. Last two questions uh, that we often hear uh, when we talk about PRC secure coding practices is why is a certain practice not on the list. And the most important answer, or the most popular answer is probably because it's not in scope. <laughs> because uh, we got a, this was a community, community project. We had about 900 people registered on a discourse platform who collaborated on, on this and who uh, submitted uh, potential PLC coding practices. And we had to limit the scope at some point. We had to make sure that our top 20 secure PRC coding practices actually kept be coding practices. So we have the scope that's, that's lined out here. Uh, everything that's the scope is anything that includes changes to the PRC itself. So this one here. What's not in scope is 
and that's a potential second scope that we could be doing um, is top 20 secure PRC environment practices as a working title. So everything that involves architecture, that involves HMI, programming in device, or I.O. requirements or documentation could be on a second list. Second question uh, that we get a lot of times is, why is this practice on the list at all? It's so basic. But there are actually three cases why someone would say it's so basic. First is a security person says that. The PRC support practice is really too basic for security people. Everyone knows about that. But a simple answer why it's on the list anyway is because security people don't program PRCs. It doesn't help if security people know about it. PRC programmers need to know about it. And that's the, the target group of our list. And also, security people may know about this practice, but do they know about how uh, about its implementation on a PLC? The requirement may be basic, but not its implementation. And then we also wanted to do something against the myth that security practices are simple, but PLCs are simply too dumb to implement them. Um, that is true for some practices, but it's not true for others. And we want to put the practices explicitly explicitly on the list that can be implemented on a PRC. So that's the first one. The second is PRC programmers say, well, that's so basic. It's, it, this, I, I've been doing that for years. Every PRC programmer knows about that. And that may be true. They may, be, they, they may be know that it's a good practice, but they, they may not know it in fact has a security benefit, and then they also should do it because for security reasons. And that becomes important first when you want to talk about what a secure PLC is, of course, but also it becomes important because it adds one more reason why you should do a certain practice. So if you decide not to do it because it's, it's just for efficiency reasons and efficiency is not as important, it's important that PLC programmers know that this practice they may be leaving out also has security benefits. And, they are on the other on the other way way around. They also have a security problem if they don't implement them. And then, lastly, there are practices um, we'll just say, well, it's it's too basic because everyone knows and everyone has been doing this for years anyway. But if anyone, everyone has been doing a certain practice in order to securely program PRCs for years. <laughs> I hope we can we can agree that it absolutely belongs on the top 20 secure PRC coding list. So that's why it's on there. And also, there's always rookies, there's always newbies, there's always new people that do not fall under everyone and they don't do not know. And I want to remind you of our true leading questions that I mentioned in the beginning, which were we want to answer, we want to pull up a list which which defines what it means to securely program a PRC. And we want to have a list that answers the questions, what, what is a secure PRC? So we want to be basic. Being basic is really one of our list's purposes. So now that we've answered most of your questions, hopefully that arise, that could arise by looking at that list and you have a small, I have an idea of what it's all about. I hope you're ready. I'm hoping you're ready for the deep dive into a couple of questions, uh, practices. Um, that Vivek will introduce to you now. Vivek, stage is yours. Hey, ICS Village folks at DEF CON. Hope you're all enjoying the conference so far. I'm here with Sarah Flutes to talk about secure coding practices for PLCs. A little bit about me, Vivek Ponada. I have 23 plus years experience in industrial control systems. I've been doing ICS OT cybersecurity for the past eight plus years. My background is electronics and communications engineering. I have an MBA in finance and the GICSP cert from SANS. I started off as a controls and instrumentation technician, calibrated valves, transmitters, configuring PLCs. And I became a field engineer, commissioned gas turbines and steam turbines, control systems around the world for utilities and oil and gas customers. Then went back to business school and after that became a sales and business development manager. And currently, I serve as a service manager for our Canada fleet, my company uh, covering all utility and oil and gas customers uh, within Canada. And I've worked in several countries. My contact information is below on LinkedIn and Twitter. All right. Now that Sarah has given you the background, let's take a deep dive into a few practices to learn more. 
let's pick something straightforward for our first one. Practice 13 says disable unneeded, unused communication ports and protocols. So the controllers that we are used to generally support multiple communication protocols because they are used in various applications. Now, most of these protocols are unfortunately enabled by default even if you're not using them. As an example, Telnet or FTP, you have to actively go disable them if you're not using them. Now, the best practice recommendation is to develop a data flow diagram that clearly shows all the required communications, what ports are required to be open, and how the logical network segmentation is, what protocols are in use, so that it's clear as to why certain ports or protocols are in use and why the others aren't. Now, every additional port, every additional protocol that's enabled adds to the PLC's attack surface, and the attackers can't use if a certain port is disabled or a protocol is disabled. And you can typically alert for something that's being enabled, or perhaps you need to download to the controller to re-enable the port or re-enable that particular protocol. That gives you ways to find out that something is going on, right? In addition, perhaps you have a network sensor or a firewall that can detect if a particular protocol is in use, and if you have previously disabled that, you can get a sensor that way. But even natively, there are ways to find out if a certain disabled protocol or port is enabled. Now, following this practice of disabling unused ports and protocols, you can also reduce the potential for malformed traffic to affect the PLC. So, most PLCs don't really do well when there is a malformed traffic, and if a particular protocol is not in use, any malformed traffic uh, from a malicious actor uh, for, on that protocol is not going to affect the PLC. Now, following the practice also reduces the overall complexity because what's not there, what's not enabled, is not necessary to be maintained, administered, updated. Um, these days, you hear a lot about S bombs, software bill of materials. The idea being, if a vulnerability is found in a network stack uh, from your vendor, go investigate and find out if it's a relevant threat for your application, and then follow the mitigation path. However, if those ports or protocols are not in use, um, that just reduces the attack surface and you are at a lower risk. Next up is practice five. Again, another pretty straightforward one, using cryptographic checks or checks some integrity checks for the PLC code. Now, some PLCs have a built-in mechanism for a checksum feature, and if that's available, by all means, write that to a register, log it, mysterize it, alarm or alert it when it's changed, so you can verify the integrity of the code in the PLC in a pretty, more, pretty much straightforward manner. Now, most PLCs do not have the processing capacity to generate or check hashes. In that case, you can use EWS, the engineering workstation, to generate the hash or checksum of the compiled software. And then when you upload the binary back on the PLC, you can compare that with that EWS, and that way verify the integrity. Now, knowing if the PLC code is tampered with is essential for a few things. So number one, it'll help you notice the compromise. So if the integrity of the code uh, is suspect, compare, and you find out that what's in the PLC is not what you expect it to be, then you know you've been compromised. Also, after compromise, the file that you have, the binary that you have that you verify uh, with this cross-check can then help you understand if the PLC is safe to operate after a potential compromise because you can download that binary that you know is good and run with it. And then finally, it's also a means to verify the PLC is still running the code approved by the integrator or the manufacturer because sometimes that's necessary for warranty purposes or perhaps for compliance where you have to run a particular version of code and it can confirm by using this integrity check. Going a little bit deeper into some of the more um, interesting ones, Leave operational logic in the PLC wherever feasible, practice three. 
So on the right side, you see the HMI here, the PLC here. Uh, this practice says, you know, don't put a lot of code in the HMI here, but put all the operational code in the PLC. So the operator visualization software in the HMI these days has a lot of coding capability. Uh, initially, it was to uh, add a few alarms, uh, ad hoc, you know, maybe change some limits for those alarms, or you know, give some uh, lower level access to an operator to get some kind of uh, code in there without necessarily touching the PLC or downloading the controller. However, over time, some programmers started utilizing the HMI code because it's just easy to work with sometimes. However, calculating values like totalizers, uh, you do that in the HMI versus doing it in the PLC, uh, it's going to be a lot more accurate in the PLC because uh, PLC is much closer to the field because the I.O. is connected to the PLC. The latency in communication between the HMI and the PLC, that's a big deal because the HMI is typically polling you know, once per second or every other second or as needed. So if the HMI is not getting enough updates, it's not in a good position to do a totalizer or a timer uh, based on you know what the PLC can do versus the HMI. And then the HMI, uh, usually uh, rebooting the HMI shouldn't cause any process uh, upset, shouldn't affect the PLC operation. However, if you use the HMI for these data or updates or values and totalizers, then that's a problem because if you reboot the HMI, those get reset. Similarly, uh, if you're doing a Windows patch or if you're taking a backup, you know, that periods of availability or unavailability of the HMI uh, might affect those values which you do not want. So anything safety or protection related is better off being handled by the PLC. As an example, enable or disable actions. I've seen where the operator clicks on an enable button and that click is shown, visualized to the operator as if the action is being performed and then the command is sent to the PLC. However, what if the PLC cannot execute that command? What if the PLC has some force items that stopping it from executing it. Those are not visible to the operator because this code is in the HMI. Similarly, uh, if you have a time delay uh, for a motor restart and if you put that in the HMI code, what if because of comms issues or any other problems, uh, the HMI cannot calculate the timer properly, then it's not a safe situation for the motor to restart or not to restart when you want it to. Uh, four signals, they're typically visible only in the PLC and not in the HMI, so you can't really put some safeguards in the HMI code as much as you can in the PLC. Similarly, inconsistent visualization or status when the HMI values are not propagated back to the PLC. So if you configure something new, some new points, some new alarms, but they're not represented in the PLC, then you have some inconsistency. And also, the PLC doesn't know that these other things exist. And then finally, consistency in code maintenance, audit, and change management. Because you split the code into two different places, these become difficult. Furthermore, if you unify your code in the PLC, you're reducing the attack surface. You all can imagine more scenarios where the HMI is uh, open to more public facing, maybe in the internet, and Someone is able to access and move the mouse around. We've seen that, uh, for example, in the Florida uh, water situation, where you know, they were able to even enter some values uh, much higher than what the uh, what the water should contain. Uh, those kind of attack scenarios you all can imagine in the HMI level. However, if the code is in the PLC, then there's a lot less risk because uh, the threat actor needs to be a lot more sophisticated and a lot more focused on uh, proceeding with the attack versus randomly moving the mouse around and uh, enabling disabling anything that they can see. Next up is uh, practice 11, which is instrument for plausibility checks. Now, I've given an example here um, for you all to kind of imagine some of the uh, examples I'm going to talk about. We have a couple of tanks, some pumps, and some instruments here. So this practice is about comparing 
integrated and time independent measurements to confirm if the measurement that you're seeing is accurate. For example, a meter pump and tank level, the volumetric change in the tank should equal or be proportional to the integrated flow. Um, if it's not, then there is an alert. Similarly, burner in a boiler, the added caloric heat uh, from the fuel should equal or be proportional to the temperature increase, and if it's not, then there is an alert. The idea being compare different measurement sources. So measuring, for example, the same phenomenon at different ways. Another example, uh, compressed stall is typically uh, visualized by a reversal of flow. However, it will also have increased vibration. So those two are measuring the same phenomenon at different rates. And also, not necessarily different sensors, but maybe the same value coming from two different communication channels. Maybe that PLC has a backlink communication and the mod goes out to the DCS, and then also 40 20 milliamps to uh, the DCS or some other equipment where you can compare. And if it so happens that whoever is manipulated one did not manipulate the other, you will get an alert that something is wrong. So the idea behind this practice is to facilitate monitoring for manipulated values as long as not all sensors are manipulated at the same time. Just another level or another layer of protection uh, in a PLC where none existed before. Now, it also prevents acceptance or identifies wrong measurements like we talked about before. Uh, if the tank level suddenly shows much higher than what it should be in correlation with the volumetric or the, uh, the flow coming from the flow meter, then you can identify that some measurement is wrong. Also, able to rule out the physical causes for failures more quickly. Uh, if you do believe that tank level, for example, you might think that this particular valve has failed. Uh, however, if you're comparing that with the flow, you kind of know that the valve is okay because, you know, based on that flow, you, you could not have, have this level. For example. All right, next up is practice seven, which is validate an alert for paired inputs and outputs. Now, paired inputs and outputs are those that are physically not able to happen at the same time. For example, a motor could be uh, running or not running. So, it could be started, it could be stopped, but not both at the same time. Similarly, a conveyor belt could be forward or reverse, not move at the same time, and of course a valve could be open or closed, but not both at the same time. So the pair signals cannot be asserted at the same time unless there is a failure. For example, uh, this open limit switch is working fine, but the closed limit switch failed and also shows close, uh, so that's an instrument failure, or a malicious activity where someone is trying to force a bunch of things and they also have to force both the open and close. Uh, also the closed when it's actually open. Now some additional recommendations as part of this practice is to configure start and stop as distinct outputs as long as the MCC is capable of receiving, receiving those outputs instead of a single output that can be toggled on and off because it's way more complicated to rapidly toggle uh, two distinct outputs, especially if they have to be set a certain way. Uh, it's very difficult in a PLC versus just one output that you can rapidly uh, uh, switch on and off. And then also consider adding a timer for restart after stop is issued. This again helps in avoiding rapid toggling of the start-stop signals, uh, whether due to uh, errors or due to uh, a bad intent. And finally, uh, let's take a look at practice 16, which is summarize PLC cycle times and turn them on the HMI. So cycle time is the time it takes to complete each iteration of the logic of the PLC. And these cycle times should be fairly constant in the PLC unless there are changes to the network environment or the PLC logic or the process. As an example here, we see uh, the, the time over here and then the cycle times. So the expected fluctuation a little bit here, but then every so often we get the spike, which could be malicious both. Now, unusual cycle time changes can be an indicator that the PLC logic has changed, some code has been added. Uh, visualizing these values over time draws attention to these anomalies. 
uh, because let's say you have a threshold somewhere here, uh, none of these triggered it, but visualizing it in this way, in this manner, can help you understand that something's going on. So many PLCs have this maximum cycle time monitoring at the hardware level. So in this graph, it's the number of cycles and the time for the cycle. So if it exceeds a maximum value, usually the CPU issues a stop. So at this Tmax, this number five, uh, the CPU would stop. So attackers would know this, so they typically don't add code that much. They typically keep the code lean so that you never reach that threshold. However, if you happen to create these boundaries, have these acceptable thresholds, so one and three would be okay, but anything above would be alerted. Uh, this would be based on the application, the process engineer's understanding of the process, and the PLC controls engineer working with the process engineer to define these thresholds. But the idea being about these thresholds, uh, if you have some uh, alerts that if and when some malicious traffic or malicious code has been added and the PLC uh, cycle time is higher than what it should be, you get an alert. All right, now I hand it over to Sarah to talk further about what the expectations are on the project. So yeah, that's me again. And actually, um, my last words are about the outlook. What, what, what do we have to, what, what do, we, do we do with this project in the future? Because obviously we're not done yet. Uh, we've worked on this for about a year. Um, we put our first document out and we don't have got a lot of things that we, that we need to do. And the important thing to know is there's a core team um, that meets every couple of weeks um, and that has a few things on its to-do list. So one is we are thinking about doing top 20 secure PLC environment practices, for example. We're thinking about building a playground, so building virtual PLCs where you can try out uh, practices virtually where, where there are demonstrators that you could download or try out online. Um, of course, we're thinking about uh, improving the practices, uh, publishing a version 2.0 based on comments that come in. If you go to our website that I'll show you in a minute, you can download a comment form and leave us any comment you want and they're really all welcome. Um, and we want to improve these practices. Um, comments can be, this practice doesn't make sense. It can be, I implemented this and this could be a good example. It can be, I don't understand this. Uh, we could explain that better this way. Or it can be, I've got a completely new practice that needs to be on that list and that I want to propose. We've got a template for that. We're also working on translations to other languages because obviously we want engineers to adopt that list. And the easiest way to adopt something that is, is in your language is in, in your language is just, just way easier. And we're also thinking about training a template for PLC coding practices, how to involve them in purchasing specifications, because that's one easy application uh, that could be a lot of use for, for users, for asset owners. And that's the core team. We've got commenters. So I said that before, uh, everyone is, is, is really invited to comment. It's not a lot of work and we're looking forward to, to talking about your comments. Um, we've got supporters who build trainings, uh, who write articles and podcasts. And uh, we are, we're thinking about collaborations, which is a, an important part. So we are collaborating with MITRE CWE in order to maybe um, put a module for PLCs in CWE because it doesn't have something like this not, uh, yet. Um, but we really, 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 and that's one of the most important points that I want to make in the end, we, we want to get this list seen by engineers, used by engineers, trained for by engineers. We want to get this list out there. Um, and we're really looking into uh, how to best reach engineers, because the security bubble knows about this, but we need engineers to know about this. Uh, so we're looking for engineers associations. We're really interested in what PLC vendors say. Say we're really interested into PLC user groups. Um, if you have contact in there, contact us. We can get these slides there. We can get a presentation organized. We can get trainings organized. We can, we can get you in there. Uh, we collaborate with you in order to bring these knowledge 
into your communities locally, regionally. We have people all around the world in the project that are happy to do that. And lastly, what's very important in this slide is the green bubbles. So this is not a closed club, it's a community project and we really want and need everyone who's interested uh, and passionate about making PLCs more secure. You don't have to be a, C a PLC programmer, you don't have to be a security expert. Uh, if you're passionate enough, you can totally um, use your knowledge and, and your, your engagement. And it really, in each of these groups, there's a lot of, a lot of space for, for taking up new people and we welcome you with open arms. Lastly, here's the project website. And here's our, our, all our contact details. If you want to uh, contribute, if you want to be part of any of the teams, of the core team, shoot an email to plcsecurity at uh, We've got a Twitter account you can follow, uh, both Vivek and I are on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Um, and there's also um, a co the comment form on that website here you can download and send to that email address. Um, we would be very, very happy to hear from you. I hope you learned something about secure PLCs today and I hope you continue enjoying DAFCON. Thank you.